Our hearts turn uh, to what's happening in Florida, and God, we pray that your peace and your comfort would be upon them. But Lord, we don't have to go too far. Even among us, there are those, Lord, that are in trials and tribulation. There are those among us, God, that are facing some very difficult times in life, even maybe the loss of a loved one, maybe illness, maybe issues with family, maybe issues with themselves. And Father, we pray that as you are here with us, you are there in Florida, we pray that your peace and your hand be upon them, Lord. We pray that you touch them, God, you strengthen them. And Father, I pray that you would help us, those that are here, that love you, that claim to know you, that we would live right and do what's right, Lord, not what's wrong. Lord, this young man, Nicholas, we pray for him as he's there trying to make sense. His family, those that uh, Lord watched over him, we ask that your peace and strength be upon them also, God. We commit to you, Lord, this day on our service and this message. Use it to speak to our hearts. I pray and I ask you this in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. What I want to do today is today I start a new series on stewardship. For those of you that don't know what stewardship is, let me tell you what stewardship is. Stewardship is the biblical teaching that says this. It says God has blessed you. God has given you a lot. And you have a responsibility before God to manage it right. You are a trustee of the many blessings of God. And all of those things that God has given you, you are responsible to handle them and manage them in a way that honors Him and glorifies Him. And I'm going to be talking to you for the next four weeks on the subject of stewardship. Today, I want to talk to you on the subject of trust, the key to successful living. By the way, every relationship, all good relationships are based on trust. If you don't have trust, you're not going to have good relationships. And as we talk about stewardship and our responsibility before God and what God says about stewardship, one of the things that needs to happen right up front is you need to trust God. You need to have trust in Him. You need to know that God will always do what's right. God will never do what's wrong in your life. God will never ask you and me to do something that will hurt us. It's all for our good. And I want to talk to you about that. I want to, in the next four weeks, about that. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about stewardship. And so what I want to do is today through the message, I want to give you some stewardship ideas, what I call stewardship statements. I also want, you to, I want to talk to you about the trustworthiness of God. We serve a God that is trustworthy. You know, as God asks us to do things, you can know that you can't go wrong because our God is trustworthy. And then I want to end the message this morning and the time that we're together talking about developing our trust for the Lord. Why do we need to trust Him? When do we need to trust Him? What does that look like? Some of you are here today and you're asking yourself, can I trust God? Is God dependable? Does he even care about me? And I want to tell you today, he is trustworthy and he cares about you. He's concerned about you. There is nothing that you go through that God does not care about. So with that in mind, I want to call your attention to the book of Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. And in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through 10, there's some marvelous words of wisdom for us about our relationship with God. And it talks there about some things that we need to know if we're going to be successful, if we're going to be all that God wants us to be, if we're going to enjoy the many blessings that God has. By the way, Christians, there are two major questions that Christians are always asking. There are the top two questions that Christians ask is this. Number one, how can I know God's will? If God has a will for my life, how can I know it? And then the second question, top question that Christians have is how can I be a success? for God, for others, and myself. And here's the answer to those questions in a nutshell. Trust. Trust is the most important factor in knowing God and His will for your life. Trusting God is the most important thing you can do if you want to be successful. Because if you follow the formula and the recipe and the advice and the wisdom that God gives in His Word, you will always be successful. You will go forward. So let me read it to you. Let me read to you Proverbs 3, chapter 1 through 10 from the CEV, which stands for the Contemporary English Version. And I want you to notice what it says there. Notice notice what it says, starting in verse 1. And if you don't have your Bible, it'll be up in the screen. Here it goes. My child, remember my teachings and instructions and obey them completely. I want you to notice that word completely. As the, because as the proverb writer begins to talk to us about our relationship with God, he talks about A good relationship is based on trust, and it's based on complete obedience. And if you are trusting God, and if you are obedient to the Lord, notice the results in verse 2. They will help you live a long and a prosperous life. Verse 3. Let love and loyalty always show like a necklace, and write them in your mind. Verse 4. God and people will like you and consider you a success. Notice in verse 3, always. 
Let love and loyalty always. You know, the writer of the Proverbs talks about loving and loyalty as being always the center of our lives. That's the idea of a necklace. You know, when you're talking to someone and they have a necklace and you're looking at the first thing you notice is the necklace. What a beautiful necklace. So what the Bible says that as people interact with you, as people watch you, one of the first things they should notice about you if you're a believer is your love and your loyalty to God. That's the first thing people are going to see. And what they're going to see is not, you're, as a result of your love and your loyalty to God, they will notice that, you know what? God is with you. And because God is with you, you're together. You are a success. Look at verse 5. With all your heart, you must trust the Lord. Notice the word trust there and, and not your own judgment. Notice all your heart. Trust means to have confidence, to, to build, be secure. People that have trust are people that are secure, people that feel safe. When you trust somebody, you're safe around them. God says you can trust him. Look at verse 6. Always let him lead you and he will clear the road for you to follow. Notice, with all your heart, he says, that's where it starts. And then he says, always Always with all your heart, let him lead you. You know, not sometimes. The, the, the writer to the Proverbs tells us that if we do these things, he will guide our steps. He will lead the road for us to follow. The Bible says in another verse that the, uh, the, the steps of a righteous man and woman are ordered of God. God wants to order your steps. Some of you are here today and you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what my next steps are. Go to God. Put him first and he'll guide your steps. He'll tell you what you need to do. And if you go out and you do your own thing, you're going to fail. But if you do what God says, you will always, you know what? He will always guide your steps. Look at verse 7. Don't ever think that you are wise enough, but respect the Lord and stay away from evil. In other words, don't ever. You know, and if we do that, look at verse 8. This will make you healthy and you will feel strong. Honor the Lord by giving him your money and the first part of all your crops. Then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. Notice all Honor the Lord by giving him, you know, from all of your crops, from all of what's yours. Now, there's a couple of observations. There's a lot there, and I, I'm not going to have time to break it all down, but let me just make a few observations about what God's Word tells us there about stewardship, about us, and about our relationship and our trust with God. Notice the first thing is that some of those words there are all inclusive words. He didn't say partially obey our Lord's teachings. No. He said, you know, completely obey the Lord. He didn't say with, with most of our heart, you know, we're to trust in him. He says with all of our hearts. He doesn't say sometimes, you know, let him lead you. He says always let him lead you. They are all inclusive words. In other words, it talks about total surrender, total obedience, total trust in God. That's the theme. If I were to summarize Proverbs 3 verses 1 through 10, I could use two, two words. And it's this, trust God. You and I need to trust God. The Bible tells us and talks to us about trusting God. But here's the problem. We rather trust in ourselves than trust in God. We rather do what we think than to do what God thinks. And then things don't work out because we're doing our own thing. And then we want to blame God. God, where are you? And God says, I'm here. Where are you? Why are you following your path? What are you doing? You're, why are you not obeying me and trusting me? I know better than you. That's, that's the summary of everything there. Trust God. Here's the second thing that I want you to, to know about that, those verses. All of those verses about trusting God are promises from God, but they come with a command. These words are promises, but there's a command in front of the promises. In other words, here's what I'm telling you. God tells us that if we do these things, he will do some wonderful things in return. What that verse says is that there are promises that God has made. And, and some promises of God are unconditional and some are conditional. Now let me tell you the difference. When God makes a promise that is unconditional, what that means is that God will fulfill his word whether you do your part or not. There are things that God said that you and I we can never earn, we can never deserve, we can never pay back. What's an example of that? God's love. God loves you. Nothing, nothing you do is going to change that. God is madly in love with you. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. He's pursuing you. And God is knocking and at the door of your heart every chance he gets. And nothing, nothing will ever stop that. That's an unconditional promise of God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He loves you. That, that is not going to stop. You cannot stop that. You cannot, you know, there's nothing you can do that's going to avoid that. 
But there are other promises that are conditional. There's a lot of unconditional ones, but there are conditional ones. You say, well, well, what's the difference? Well, the conditional promises are things that you have to do. God says, I'll do this, but you have to do your part. Your part is required. An example of that is salvation. God, because he loves you, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin. You know, but that's, him dying on the cross doesn't save you. What saves you is when you repent of your sins and you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner, I need you. Your part is to come to the Lord, open your heart, repent of your sins, and confess that Jesus is Lord. That's your part. And in the Bible, there's a lot of promises that God makes that are very conditional. God says, I will do this, you got to do this. You do this, I'll do this. So one of the things that you're going to notice in those 10 verses that I read to you is that there are promises that he made that are very conditional. They're conditional. Our part is required. You've got to do something. And uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Go back to that verse and notice what it says. First one says, my child, remember my teachings and instructions and obey them completely. That's the command. Notice the promise. They will help you live a long and a prosperous life. That's the promise. You do that, your life will be blessed. Your life will be orderly. Your life will have my blessing up upon it. Here's the verse three. Notice the command. Let love and loyalty always show like a necklace and write them in your mind. Look at the promise in verse four. God and people will like you and consider you a success. You know, if you're a godly person and loving the Lord, people are going to like you. You're going to ingratiate yourself toward people. People are going to look at you and say, wow, that's a pretty cool person. You know what? That's an amazing person because of the love of God in you, your loyalty to the Lord. And because of that, people will look at you and they will root for you and they will be on your corner. They'll be on your side. They're, they will help you when the need arises because they see God. God says, listen, you love me with all of your heart and you trust me, you know, and, and let love and loyalty and people will look at you and they will say, you know, that's an amazing person. All right. Look at, he says in uh, verse six, he says, always let him lead you. Notice the promise in, in there. And he will clear thy road for you to follow. God is with you. He'll be with you. Verse seven, notice the command. Don't ever think that you're wise enough, but respect the Lord and stay away from evil. Notice the promise. This will make you healthy and you will feel strong. You do what God says and God will bless you. God will bless your life. God will bless your health. God will bless everything about you. You will have it together. That's the promise. Look at verse 9, the command. Honor the Lord by giving him your money and the first part of all your crops. Notice the promise. He says, then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. God says, put me first. You know, everything you have, the Bible teaches, is from God. It's not yours. You're simply managing it for a while. And God says, if you put me first in everything, you know what, in your life, in your possessions, in your marriage, in your career, I will bless you and I will give you more than you ever need. I, in other words, I will bring abundance upon your life. That's what it says. These promises, notice, that are there, they're conditional. We got to do our part and God does his part. But you got to trust him. It's all based on trust. Here's what I have learned. I have learned that people that don't trust God will never do what God says. Well, let me put it this way. People that you don't trust, you will never listen to those people you don't trust. People that you don't feel secure around, people you don't feel safe around, you will never listen to those people. And that's the same thing with God. If you don't trust God, you're never going to do what God says. Can I hear a good amen to that? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, can I trust God? You know, the God who makes these commands, the God who makes these promises. You know what, the God that says that he loves me. Can I trust him? Is God trustworthy? And I want to tell you today a couple of things about the trustworthiness of God. Number one is God is trustworthy. You can trust God. He is worthy of your complete confidence. You can totally depend on God. God is trustworthy. If there's anyone that you can trust that's trustworthy, it's God. Can I hear an amen to that? You can trust the Lord. Here's the second thing I want you to understand. Because God is trustworthy, God has entrusted, in other words, placed within our care, the possessions, the opportunities, the talents, and the time that we now experience. What does that mean? It means this. Our trustworthy God, he wants to turn around and he wants to trust you and he trusts you. And everything that you have, it's not yours, it's God. And God has entrusted you. You say, well, what has he entrusted with me, me with? He's entrusted you with life. He's entrusted you with the marriage if you're married. He's entrusted you with children if you have children. He's entrusted you with the career. He's entrusted you with, with, you know, with a lot of stuff. 
You don't, you don't own it. God has, your life is not your life. God allows you to have that life, you know what, for a season, for a small time. The Bible says that life is like a vapor. It's here now, it's gone. It's like a flower that, that blooms and blossoms, that blossoms, and then it withers away. And when God says it's time, your life is gone, you know, people are realizing that, you know, this life, you know, that it belongs to God, and he simply has let me have it for a, for a, for a season. The other day, I was watching in the news, and there on the 10 going to Colton, the semi sort of crossed over, killed five people. Do you think those five people woke up that morning and said, today's the day I'm going to die, today's the day I go into eternity? They had no clue. None of us have a clue. But the Bible says that we're born and eventually all of us will take our last breath. Not when you decide, when God decides. But right now, this precious life that God has given us, it's only ours for a season. You know, so that the third thing I want you to know is the things that God has given you, you're a trustee of everything God has given you. You're simply a manager. You're not the owner of it. You know what a trustee is? A trustee is someone who overlooks the affairs of another. You're not owners. You're managers. We're called, the Bible calls that stewards. We are stewards of the many blessings of God. You know, and God says, you know what, I want you to trust me about what I tell you to do with those things. So I want to ask you this morning, do you trust God? Is he truly your source of strength, of trust? Or do you trust more in yourself? You know, it's easy for us to say, I trust God and I want to obey God. But honestly, do we really trust him? I want to challenge you today to think about the fact that God is trustworthy and you can trust him in everything that he says. That's why over the next four weeks, I want to talk to you about things that God says that you can trust about you, about your life, about everything God has given you. And God says, I want you to trust me. I don't know about you, but I trust God with my life. That's why 45 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you're trusting him with your life. You're saying, Lord, here's my life. And God says, good, I'll do better with your life than you could ever do for yourself. You know, people ask me, did you ever imagine, you know what, when you were a 16-year-old boy that you would be a pastor? Did you ever imagine doing the things that you've done, you know, all of that stuff? I go, it wasn't even on my radar. I had no clue. But I tell you what I did do. I gave my life to the Lord. I said, Lord, here's my life. You do whatever you want with my life. And I'll tell you, it has blown my mind what God has done because God does a lot better than I could ever do when we trust him. Can I hear a good amen to that? Yes. So are you trusting God? So listen, here's what I want to tell you. You can trust God. Some of you are here and you question whether I can trust God. Is God trustworthy? He's absolutely trustworthy. Can I trust him? Yes, you can. For what? Well, there's a lot of things you can trust him for. First of all, with your life. You can trust him with your life. But let me give you a couple ideas. Trustworthy thoughts about God. Number one, God's care is constant. You can trust God that he cares about you. You matter to God. God cares about you. When it comes to trusting God, you can rest assured that he loves you and he cares for you in all ways. A lot of people don't believe that God cares for them. A lot of people have convinced themselves he loves everybody else, but he doesn't love me. No, he loves you. Or he loves good people. I'm a bad person. He doesn't love me. He loves bad people also. God loves you. If you let him, he'll love you. Over there in Hebrews in chapter 13, notice what it says. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? In other words, I want you to notice, that's a wonderful promise. You know what, that, you know what scripture says? Not only there, but all over the place. It says, God cares about you. He loves you. Let me read it to you in the original language. In the original language, this is what it says. God says, I will not, no, not ever leave you. Never, ever, no, I will not forsake you. That's the extent of God's care. Powerful verse. Let me break it down a little bit for you. You know the word leave, where he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. They're obviously not the same word. Leave and forsake are not the same word. The word leave is a beautiful word in the Greek, aniami, in the Greek. You know what it means? You know what aniami means? It means he will not give up on you. He's not going to send you back. He's not going to say, you know what? I don't like this guy. I'm going to send him back. 
He's not going to let you sink. It's the idea of you like a ship in life going, and God says, I don't care about him. Let the storms destroy them. Let them sink. Let their boat go down. God says, I will never, ever, if you let me, I will never, ever let your boat go down. I will always be there. I will not give up on you. God says, I will not leave you. That's what it means. And then the word forsake is a beautiful work in the Greek, in the Greek and it means I will not leave you helpless. I will not abandon you. I'm not going to leave you behind. You don't have to worry about me walking away from you. I get tired of hearing Christians say, well, God abandoned me. God walked away from me. Now listen, God never walks away from his people. We walk away from God. We want to blame him, but it's our fault. Can I hear a good amen to that? Yes. God doesn't let loose of your grip. When God has you, the, the Bible says that nothing can pluck us from the hands of God. Nothing can. He's got a good grip on you because he loves you. But I'll tell you what does happen. Sometimes we say, Lord, let go of me. Lord, I don't want you to hold me. God, I want to do my own thing. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to obey you. I don't want to trust you, Lord. I want to trust myself. I want to trust the devil more than you. And we say, Lord, let me go. And the Lord sometimes, while he holds on to us, he says, I'm not going to let you go. Well, you say, well, can I jump? He says, if you want to jump, you jump. But I will never let you go. And yet there are some people that, you know, life doesn't go their way and they blame God because God abandoned them. God left them. God will never leave you or forsake you. That's the promise of God. The truth is we abandoned God. If you're here today and you have abandoned God, come back home. He loves you. He's still concerned about you. Peter was so convinced about this that Peter writes in 1st of Peter in chapter 5 in verse 7 he says cast our cares upon him for he cares for us cares are the trials the troubles the hardships everything life throws our way Peter says you can put it on him you don't have shoulders broad enough you're not strong enough to handle all that life throws your way but if you put it on him you can handle it he cares for you you can trust him he won't let you down and it's not occasional. It's not sporadic. No, his care is total. It's not partial. You know, we give him partial obedience and partial trust. His care for us is totally complete. Nothing can touch you or me without it first touching God. One of the things that I've learned as a Christian is, even when I go through rough times, if God is allowing it, he's allowing it for a reason. There is a lesson. There is something good. There is a blessing in this hardship that I cannot see or even imagine. But God, if he's allowing it, it's because there's good in it for me. Can I hear a good amen to that? Many of you have read that poem, Footprints. Very moving, uh, picture, very moving poem. It's written by a lady, and her name was Margaret Fishbeck Powers. There should be a picture of her up there. That's her in, her in her latter years. And she's the one that wrote the poem called Footprints. And she wrote it during a very difficult time of her life. She writes, and she says, you know, the person that I loved walked away from me. Shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with meningitis. I was bedridden, she says, for months. And it was the lowest time of her life. Very low time. Very difficult time of her life. You know, shortly thereafter, she got through it, and some guy, you know, fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. And, and the guy says, you know, I, I, I want you to marry me. And she says, I can't marry you. And he said, why? He goes, because I don't trust any. I don't trust God. I don't trust men. I definitely don't trust you. I don't have any trust. My trust the meter is broken. I, I just don't trust anymore. And then anyway, through a series of, of events, she tells a story how one night she couldn't sleep. And she pulled out a pen and a pad and she began to write. And what came out of that was what we know today as the poem called Footprints. Let me read it to you. And some of you know it, but here's what she wrote. She goes, one night I dreamed, I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand and I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the lowest, very lowest, and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, she said. So I asked the Lord about it. And I said, Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. You'd never leave me. You'd never forsake me. But I noticed that during the saddest and the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you left me, you walked away, you abandoned me. She said that the Lord replied to her and said, my precious, precious child, I love you. 
And like I said, I would never leave you and I would never forsake you. And during your times of trial and suffering and during the lowest moments of your time, and you look back and you saw that one set of footprints, they were my footprints because I was carrying you. You didn't have the strength. And without me, you wouldn't have gotten that far. You see, she's thinking God had left her. She th she's thinking God had abandoned her. But listen, here's what I'm telling you. You can trust God, and God's constant care is for you. He does not abandon his children. God is trustworthy. You and I serve a God that we can take it to the bank and believe it with all of our hearts because he is a trustworthy God. Can I hear a good amen? Now notice, notice you can trust God, not only because his constant care is yours, but here's the second reason why you can trust him. You know what? God's gifts are generous. God is a generous God. Our trustworthy God is very generous. He's generous in his provisions to us. Listen, think about all the things that you have that you probably don't deserve. You know, I, uh, I, once, when you travel to parts of the world where people are very poor, and you look at all they don't have, and then you think about all you have, you say, man, we are blessed. I don't deserve all, I mean, most people don't, you know, uh, 60, 70 percent of people around the world don't own a car. You guys own, families own three, four cars. And you know, you look around and you say, you know what, God has been very good to us. And if you look around, he's blessed you not only with things, but he's blessed you with talents, all kinds of blessings. Our trustworthy God is a generous God. He's a good God. Over there in Psalm 136, as the people of Israel, as they thought about the goodness of God, they would they would do these, what, what are called, uh, you know, these, uh, these readings where reflective readings or these responsive readings. And it was, it was not uncommon for, you know, they would, they would say something about God and then the people would respond. And one of those responsive, what we know as an antiphonal liturgy or a responsive reading is found over there in Psalm 136 verses 1 through 9. And what, what they would do is that the priest would get up and he would talk about the blessings of God. Let me read it to you. Psalm 136, verse 1. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then the people would say, For his mercy endures forever. I want you to say that when I read the next verse. Verse 2. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of the Lord of Lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by wisdom made the heavens. To him who laid out the earth above the water. To him who made great law, lights for his mercy endures forever. To the sun to rule by day. The moon and the stars to rule by night. And he goes on and he goes on. And every time he thinks about the greatness of God and the blessings of God, you know what? What the psalmist would tell the people is that God's love never fails. We can trust God. And the people would say amen to that. And the way they said amen to his constant care, his generosity, is that they would say his mercy endures forever. They're acknowledging that God is a generous God. I wonder if we really acknowledge that our God is a generous God. Think about all that God has blessed you with. And I, I just think about how many times we take credit for everything God has done. We pat ourselves in the back. Oh, look at what I've accomplished. When the truth of the matter is because his mercies endure forever. It's the goodness of God. It's not us. God is good. So what I want to do in the last few minutes that I have, I want to encourage you to develop trust for God. You know what? Trust him. You can. He is trustworthy. You know what? He cares for you. He blesses you. And he wants to continue. He will not leave you nor forsake you. But I, I want to encourage you to develop trust. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And you say, well, pastor, what do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. You can trust him in adversity. You can trust him in the difficult times of your life. Trust him when things are not going good. You know, be aware that even though things are not always going good, because I'm not here to tell you that if you love the Lord and trust Him, everything will always be fine and everything will be, you know what, a, a, a walk in the rose garden. No, there are difficult moments that we go through. We call it adversity. We call it problems. We call it trials. We call it temptation. Whatever you're going to call it. But during those times, you can trust God. Trust Him doesn't matter what you're going through. Today, you may be facing an illness where doctors giving you bad news. Maybe, you know, with your family, with your kids, with your job, with your marriage, whatever it is, it's a tough time. But I tell you, we serve a God that nothing is too hard for God. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. amen. 
I like what David writes in Psalm 56. And I'm reading to you from the message, verses 1 through 4. He says, he's praying, and David says, take my side, God. I'm getting kicked around, stomped, stomped on every day. Not a day goes by, but somebody beats me up. They, they make it their duty to beat me up. And when I, really, when I get really afraid, I come to you and trust. I'm proud to praise God, fearless now. I trust in God. What can mere mortals do? David says, Lord, I'm facing trials. I'm facing hardship. People want me dead. People want to destroy me. And Lord, sometimes I don't know what to do. But when I go to you, I realize I can trust you. I realize I don't have to be afraid. I realize I'm going to be okay because you're a trustworthy God. That's what David is saying. Over there in Psalm 34, in verse 6, he says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all of my fears. In other words, David recognized this. He had no power to save himself, but he served a God that was powerful and trustworthy and would see him through all of his fears. Listen, you're going through stuff today, and one of the things you realize, I don't have the power to deal with this or solve this. I don't even have the ability, even if I do my part, my part of what I, what's got to be done. But God, God can work with you, with her, with your boss, with whoever, your kids. God has the ability to do things you and I cannot do. But here's the problem, and I'll tell you what the problem is. A lot of times, you know what, we, we think God doesn't care. We think God can't. And you know, sometimes if we're not careful, we say, Lord, you, 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 you don't even know what's going on. Lord, you don't even know what's going on in my marriage. You don't know what's going on in my life. Lord, you don't know what's happening with my... God, you have no clue. And sometimes we convince ourselves that not only does God not know, but God doesn't care. And yet the Bible says he does care. He cares for you. You know what? He does care for you. You know how I know that? Because it says that God so loved us that he sent his son. You know how I know that? The Bible says that your tears, every tear that you shed, God sees it, and he puts it in a bottle of remembrance. God knows you so well that he knows every hair on your head. For some of you that are bald-headed, that's pretty easy. For others, it's a little bit complicated. He cares. And we're responsible. God speaks to you and says, trust him in adversity. You know what? But we, the only way that's going to happen is we don't have the strength. You've got to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You know what I have learned? I have learned that my willpower is not enough. You know what? My education is not enough. What I know is not enough. What I've learned is that if I'm going to make it, I've got to trust God with all of my heart. I don't have... You know what? All of the resources, but God has all the resources you need. You're here today, and you're depleted, and you're worn out, and you realize, I don't have what it takes. Let me remind you, he does have it. And all you have to do is go to him and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with all of my heart. And God will do things that you cannot do for yourself, even though you don't understand. Some of you are here, and you say, you know, Pastor, I... I I, I'm just worn out. I don't, I don't know. I know you don't, but God does. And God wants to touch your heart, and God wants you to show how strong he is and what he can do. You can trust him. Build trust in adversity. I'll tell you what, I feel bad. I feel sorry for people that aren't Christians that go through adversity, but they have nobody to lean on. They have nowhere to go. I, well, I'll tell you what they do. They lean on drugs and alcohol, and they lean on behaviors to sort of, you know, sedate themselves, medicate themselves, because they have nowhere else to go. You, as a Christian, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the most trustworthy, all-powerful God of the universe that cares for you, and He cares about your adversity and what you're going through. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Listen, also trust Him in plenty. Trust Him in not only adversity, Trust him in, pl in plenty. In other words, trust him that he's blessing you. You know what I have found? I have found that we trust God more when we're struggling and when we're doing well, we don't think we need God. I have found that when things are going well, we sort of lose perspective. You know, I, and we give ourselves credit for what God has done. You know, we, we, we pat ourselves in the back. I don't need God. As a matter of fact, we tell the Lord, Lord, I got this. I don't need your help. I got this. I can handle this because I'm a wonderful guy. I'm a together guy. And it's in times of blessing that if we're not careful, we tend to wander and get sidetracked and get away from the Lord. No, listen, in times of plenty, you can trust him also. You can honor him also. Amen. Can I hear a good amen to that? Yes. And here's the third thing I want to say to you. 
Trust God as your source. He is your source. You know, our, our human tendency is to trust in God's instrument of provision rather than in God himself. Sometimes we trust in the job that he provides instead of trusting him. We provide, we, 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 you know what, we depend more on the health provider that keeps us healthy than God who is the real one that keeps us healthy. You know what, we, we, we depend on others when realizing it's really God. God is the source. God is your source. I love Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. It's a great verse, verse 11. And it talks to us about God as a source. Notice what it says there. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. It's a beautiful picture. Notice the next verse. It says, but the rich man's wealth is his strong city. And like a high wall in his own esteem. In other words, what Solomon does, he gives a contrast between those that trust God and see God as their source. When they're in adversity, when they're in plenty, they run to the tower, the strong tower, protects them from the enemy, protects them from all of the assaults on life. And they find themselves there, you know what, protected by God because he's their source. But on the other side, he talks about the person who's wealthy. And to the wealthy person, the person that thinks that it's all because of them, they think that's their strong tower. You know what? They're high wall in their own esteem. In other words, they think it's all up to them. Their possessions, my money, my bank account, my education. That's what I depend on. And then the, the psalmist, uh, the writer to the proverb says, you'll be disappointed. If you put your trust and your only source in life is your job and your bank account and the things that you have accomplished, you're going to find yourself bankrupt. You're going to find yourself hurting one day because those things, you know what, they will let you down. Even if they remain, what happens inside is more important than what happens outside. I know a lot of rich people that are very miserable people. I know a lot of poor people that are miserable too. But if you're putting your, well, your, your, your source of strength in your wealth, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Those walls are going to come down. Our, our strength and our source is God and nothing else. And uh, how many of you agree with that? God is the source of our trust. But here's our tendency. Our tendency is to trust in God's instruments instead of trusting in God. God is my source. You know, it's like one guy once said, Lord, I cannot lean on you, you know, the way I want. And the Lord says, it's because you've never put your weight on me. Trust means you look to me completely, not depend on your strength. Trust in me. I want to tell you today as we begin this series, you can trust God. God is trustworthy. God wants you to trust him. He's enduringly strong. He's not just strong sometimes. He's strong every single day. You can trust him. You know what? He doesn't have, you know, to call for help. God doesn't get confused when things are going wrong in your life. God sees and he knows all. And God says, you know, you can trust me in all that you're going through. Whatever it is that's happening in your life, listen, you can trust God. Whether it's sickness, whatever it is, He will satisfy all your needs. The Bible says He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tired. He sympathizes. You know what? And He sees. He heals the sick. He forgives sinners. God can be trusted. You will never be disappointed when you put your trust in God. He's the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's all things. You can trust Him. I'm telling you today, you can trust Him. Some of you are here today, and you're sort of, I don't know, Pastor Vic, if I can trust God. I don't know. I, he might let me down. If I put Him first in my life, if I obey Him, if I follow, if I honor Him with, you know what, what's all His anyway, He, he might let me down. He won't let you down. How many of you know God's not in the business of letting his people down? We let him down. He never lets us down. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I want to say to you this morning, if you're having a crisis of trust in God, today God allowed you to come to remind you that you can trust him. And trust is built. It doesn't happen overnight. I pray that you would begin to take steps toward trusting God. The same way you learn to trust people. God is not people. God is more than people. Yes. And while people will let you down, this God that I'm telling you to trust, he will never let you down. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you're experiencing and you're wondering, does he really care? Can he really help? Can I really depend on him? I'm telling you, you can. And today, it starts with you coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Today it starts with you opening your heart. That's the first step. You see, all our talk today doesn't matter if you don't have Christ as your Savior, because that's where it starts. The promises that God makes are to His children, to those that have come to Him through Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking to you about being religious. I'm not even talking to you about changing religion. I'm talking to you about a personal relationship every single day with the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's why He came. The Bible says He came to die for your sins. And on the cross, He took your penalty, He took our punishment. He took our pain so that in this life we could experience God. And when we took our last breath, that we could be in His presence forever and ever. It starts with you coming to Christ. And if you have come to Christ, it starts with you taking steps of trusting Him, believing Him. And you're never going to experience, you're never really going to know unless you step out and you say, Lord, I want to trust you. During this month, I'm going to challenge you to trust God because stewardship, it's a matter of trust. Obeying trust, it's all a matter of trust. Doing what God says, it's all a matter of trust. So I'm going to pray that you would trust God. Father God, we thank you today for allowing us, Lord, to come. And Father, I know that there are those among us today that are wondering, is this real? Is he really trustworthy? Can I put my life in his hands and know that he will do something better than I could ever do? And Father, many of us can say amen to that. Father, there are those among us that are sick and the doctor has given them bad news and they're in despair. And Lord, today I told them that they can trust you. You're a miracle working God. Nothing is too hard. There's no marriage. There's no situation. There's no relationship. There's no circumstance that is too hard for you. So I pray in the name of Jesus right now, God, that healing would be taking place in our bodies, in our marriages, in our relationships, Lord, in our jobs, in our finances, that God, something supernatural would begin to happen in our hearts. It's not the work of men. It's not the persuasion of men. It's the power of God in our lives when we allow it. So Father, I pray for your people today. Lord, I pray for those that are having a hard time. Lord, wondering, They've convinced themselves that you don't care. Today, Lord, break down that myth. Break down those walls of a lack of trust. And let them know, today be the beginning, Lord, of a relationship that starts based on trust. Touch your people, Lord. I pray and I ask you... This.